Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Tamsin Rose, a senior fellow at Friends of Europe. And this morning, we're going to be discussing an EU heart health plan to tackle Europe's number one killer. As you're all aware, Europe is now slowly starting to emerge from the darkness of the COVID pandemic. And we're starting to look around and understand what are the lessons that we draw from it and also see where our health system has dropped care, where there are gaps and what we can do to move things forward. This morning, we're going to be focusing on the issue of cardiovascular disease. We're going to ask, how do we tackle it more effectively? Are we giving it the attention and the focus that it deserves? What more could be done at European level to support the changes at national and local level? Where are we going? What are our targets? What do we want to achieve? How can we make sure that in the future, cardiovascular disease, which is largely preventable, doesn't have the heavy burden that it does on our societies today? I'm delighted to be joined by a number of distinguished guests, and you, the participants, play a big role in this. I will be inviting you to share your feedback with us. You'll be invited to put your comments, your questions, you can share links in the chat in the Zoom, and I will be able to call on you at the moments when we have Q&A. If you do want to say something, please make sure you put your name and your organization so we know who you are so that we can bring you in. So the first thing I would like to do is I'm going to start by asking you a question. Now, if you've chosen to sign in on a webinar looking at cardiovascular disease, I'm assuming you've got an interest and you may have some level of knowledge, but let's just test that. Let's start by asking you a question, just how much cardiovascular disease costs us in Europe every single year. And if you're watching us on the live stream on YouTube rather than on um, Zoom, you probably can't see this. So let me tell you, we're asking you to vote. How much does it cost? Does it cost 50 billion a year? Does it cost 105 billion euros? Does it cost 210 billion euros or even 300 billion euros a year? So we're asking you to vote how much is it costing us to not address cardiovascular disease? And there's a second question we're asking you. Women are more likely to, than men to die from cardiovascular disease. Is this true or is this false? And again, we, we don't expect you to have a precise knowledge, but it's just to get a sense of how much you think this is a challenge and who you think are affected. So I'm gonna leave the poll open for another few seconds. So far, I can see 60% of you have voted and I'll give it another few seconds and let's see. Okay, I think we can now close the poll. And here's the results. The correct answer I was looking for on the annual cost of cardiovascular disease in Europe was 210 billion euros. And I can see that over half of you knew that, and it's to be expected if you've chosen to sign in on an event on cardiovascular disease. There were some people, there was a quarter of the people who actually thought that the cost was even more, that it was 300 billion. Um, well, you clearly understand the level of the challenge we're dealing with. But perhaps there's good news for you, it's not as bad as 300. It's 210 billion euros a year. But if you think of the population of Europe being 500 million, that's a significant proportion of money that's allocated to just dealing with cardiovascular disease. That's what it costs us. And we can clearly do better. The answer about whether women, women are more likely to die than men from cardiovascular disease is true. And you, you also saw this, more than 50% of you said that's correct. And that's because 47% of deaths of women are linked to cardiovascular disease compared to 39% of men. So what do we take from these polls? We are losing a lot of our GDP that we don't need to for cardiovascular disease, and it particularly affects women. And we know that there are gender biases in our healthcare system, which means that women are underdiagnosed, they're late diagnosed and undertreated. And this has an impact on the death rates for cardiovascular disease. So thank you all for participating in that. Let me now go straight to our first speaker, and that's Stefan Achenbach, the president of the European Society of Cardiology, also the chairman of the Department of Cardiology and professor of medicine at the University of Erlangen. 
We saw there in the polls just how much it's costing us and the heavy burden it's placing on our society. So give us some good news, Stefan. Where can we uh, make the best gains, the most gains in tackling cardiovascular disease in Europe? Well, Demsen, first of all, thank you very much for having the European Society of Cardiology on this call. The ESC represents 100,000 100, cardiovascular healthcare professionals across Europe, and I'm happy and proud to be representing the ESC here. I'm a cardiologist myself, and in fact, I was on call just this past night and this morning at one o'clock in the morning, my phone rang and my department asked me to come into the hospital to meet a patient that was brought to us with myocardial infarction. So I went to the hospital, I saw the patient coming with a myocardial infarction and it was a lady born in 1974, 46 years old. She was in a severe condition. She had two occluded coronary arteries, we placed seven stents, put her in an artificial coma gave her an artificial support pump for the heart, and so far she's doing fine, and we hope that she'll make it. So there's a number of misconceptions about heart disease, as you already said. I mean, not to the people on this call, you all know and care about heart disease, but out there in the public. For example, the problem heart disease is solved, heart attacks are no longer dangerous, and this is wrong. We just pointed out that cardiovascular disease remains the most frequent cause of death in Europe, 1.8 million deaths per year in the European Union, 36% of all deaths. Cancer is 30, 26%. Or it's a disease of the old, or it hardly affects women. You just heard it wrong, and again wrong. 20% of deaths below 65 years of age, heart disease. And more women, as you said, than men die from cardiovascular disease. So we have a massive opportunity. We must let the public and the policymakers know, simply let them know the truth about heart disease. Also, there are tremendous developments in medicine at this point in time. A massive opportunity also for cardiovascular disease. We have new drugs, completely new ways of developing drugs, artificial intelligence, genetics, genomics, robotics, and much more. But we need research to apply these new developments to cardiovascular disease. And yet, as we all know, cardiovascular disease receives only a fraction of the research funding that goes, for example, to cancer. And finally, it's inequalities. Inequality within European countries and across European countries. A woman in Lithuania is 13 times more likely to die from heart disease than a woman in France. So we need data. We need research and we need and we can tackle these inequalities. The European population deserves this. So making the, letting the public know about heart disease, the truth about heart disease, providing sufficient research funding, tackling inequalities. These are massive opportunities where we can achieve a lot and where we as a group can jointly do a lot of good for the European population if we join forces and work on this together. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. And, and, you know, if you were uh, called in at 1 a.m. to go and do complicated surgery, I thank you very much for being with us bright and early to share with us and, and giving us a really important reality check, you know, that it, it can strike at a much earlier age, people right in the heart of their productive working lives, um, and it can be extremely serious when it is picked up. So thank you for this. I know we've already started to get some comments in the chat. Um, we've been the, the figure of 210 billion that I used said, we've had somebody who says, yes, but actually we don't know the full impact uh, until we can get more data on this. So this is just an estimation. It may well be a conservative figure. We've had a comment. Um, from uh, Dr. Ivana Haskova saying, you know, we focus very much on curative medicine and we need to be doing much more prevention and promotion. Um, but somebody else has said, well, that's only one aspect. Don't forget there are congenital conditions and there are other aspects which would give you heart problems at different times. And I think that's the point that Stefan has just made, which is our perception is that this is a disease that strikes older people, that it's an issue of people 50 plus that later in life. And here in the chat and with Stefan's message, it's a reminder that we can have heart conditions that can be extremely serious and possibly fatal from, the, from birth onwards. So it's a true lifetime 
experience. Ivan, I noticed that you've raised your hand. In a few minutes after we've had a, a few more interventions, I'll open the floor and I will, I will come to you. So thank you for that. I'd now like to play a short video message that we received from an MEP, and that's Isabel Estrada Cavalet. And we asked her to say, you know, why do citizens expect Europe to do something around cardiovascular disease? Let's hear her message. Two million lives are lost every year in Europe due to its leading cause of mortality, cardiovascular diseases. Despite all the scientific improvements, all the relevant deliveries by several public policies over the past five decades in Europe, cardiovascular diseases are still a silent, massive killer. In the meantime, because of recent COVID-19 and all the distress it has caused to people's daily health routines, to medical attendants, to national health systems, we now see worrying evidence of an increase of cardiovascular diseases. However, the pandemic also showed something quite important the power of a European integrated approach as far as health is concerned. The European Health Union is a best example of our capacity to create rapidly a most powerful game changer that can provide not only fast answers on the crisis, but enables also to combat more efficiently and coordinately the burden of chronic diseases. So what we need now is to make sure that our fight against number one killer in Europe occurs also within a coordinated strategy at the EU level, gathering all the relevant contributions of multiple stakeholders. A joint EU action plan will help the European Union to deliver what citizens need and expect, prevention, treatment and care of patients with cardiovascular diseases. Thank you, Isabel, um, for highlighting again how important it is to use the full range of tools, including the, the European Health Union with its range of political and financial tools. I'd like now to invite another member of the European Parliament, that's Manuel Pizarro, to share his views because Stefan said to us that about some of the huge disparities, uh, a woman in Lithuania is 13 times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than a woman in France. Surely we can do better than that. Uh, Manuel Pizarro, from your view and perspective in the European Parliament, what can the EU do to help the transfer of best practices in tackling cardiovascular disease across Europe? Well, thank you very much for your kind invitation. For me, it's very important that we shall participate on that because I think that the European politicians shall hear the voices of citizens. And I, I have no doubt that citizens want more Union, more European Union in health issues, much more European Union. I think that the people uh, understand that we need a common and integrated approach to fight uh, uh, against health uh, issues, and mainly, of course, those who, who attack more people as, as heart disease. I, I must point out that uh, when we speak about uh, fighting uh, heart diseases, we should uh, concentrate a larger part of our attention in disease uh, uh, prevention or in health promotion, as I prefer to say. And uh, of course, disease prevention, health promotion is a community issue. So it's a political issue. So we need the, the power of political institutions, mainly in the uh, European uh, area. And uh, I think that if we think what are the really things that to threaten our art uh, health, we can speak about uh, tobacco consumption, uh, hypertension, uh, obesity, uh, diabetes, uh, sedentarism, all, all those kinds of threats need a holistic approach. We, can, we, sh we must integrate that approach in the uh, agricultural and the fisheries policy, in the um, education policies, in cultural policies, and of course in the health sector policies. So, I think that that holistic approach must have uh, uh, must be in the center of the preoccupations of the European politicians. Uh, and I think that we have now an opportunity because 
uh, in all that respects about health, uh, the normal speech of the European institutions is that this is a national, a national issue. Now, uh, COVID-19 pandemic shows to everybody that health threats are, of course, an international problem, are an European problem, and they deserve an European integrated uh, answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, for that, Emmanuel, again, for reminding us that we, the citizens, deserve better and we need to have the same political approach to try and solve these issues because of the huge impact of cardiovascular disease. We've had a comment in the chat uh, from Raymond van Holder to say that, you know, it isn't just cardiovascular disease. We need to look more broadly at the comorbidities such as diabetes and kidney disease, which are linked to the burden of cardiovascular disease. And I think this is the big challenge that we often accumulate more than one non-communicable disease. So as we get older and more of these diseases get added, it's harder to manage for health systems and for patients themselves. I'm going to bring in one more speaker before we go to the Q&A with the audience. And I'm delighted to now introduce Thuya Brax, who is the Vice President of the European Heart Network and the Secretary General for the Finnish Heart Association. So Thuya, there we, we've, we've heard that for the last 12 months, Rightly so, we have been focused on trying to find a way through the pandemic, but vaccines and non-pharmaceutical interventions are helping us to move forward and start to imagine how we could rebuild and change things. So, you know, what the pandemic showed us is when you have the political focus, the financial resources and the digital tools all applied in a concentrated way, we can make huge progress. How can we get that kind of laser focus onto cardiovascular disease, which is Europe's biggest killer. Tuya. Thank you. It's a brilliant honor to be here. And I'm so happy that all of you are here. But I think that in order to conquer, we have to face the fact that right now we are not in a winning team. If you look at what is happening to, to cancer or mental health issues, on a national level, on a European level, or even worldwide. There seems to be a common understanding that this fe feeling of being, that there is this case of alert. But when it comes to heart issues, even though we have all the facts in the world, just as we heard already today, backing our case, making, saying that we, there should be a European approach, a very high level approach to this, these things are not happening. So we are right now we have to understand that we have to do something differently in order to make us to be in the winning team. To, to put it very shortly, I think that it, this doesn't make any sense, but it makes all the difference in the world that we don't promote emotions, compassion, or even fear when it comes to public in general, and as a former politician and a minister of justice, I have to say, particularly, uh, it doesn't raise fear for voters when it comes to politicians. We have the forerunners today, and I'm really happy for that. But if you compare the feedback you get when you are talking about mental health issues or cancer issues with politicians all over the Europe, the difference doesn't make sense because the data is on our side. The data is on our side, but it makes all the difference in the world that we haven't been able to make our case raise awareness. And that means also motions, compassion, and even fear. Sometimes in the politics, when you are not on a winning side, you have to look at the mirror and think that, is there, for example, a shortage of, of the cooperation, but I think that as we look today, who are we here? We are improving all the time that all the stakeholders in this matter, we are getting better at working together. As we see today, the, the cooperation with the, the European Cardi Cardiologic Society, as we see today, and EHN that I am presenting, the, and all the stakeholders is getting better. But I think we have to admit that we can do a little bit better, even in that concept. All right, then another case, sometimes if you are not in a winning team, but that you are in this sort of a loop of not getting your message through, can be also that you just complain and you don't have any ideas what should be done. But this is not the case either. We have 
proposals, initiatives, already heard already today also, that we are not just complaining, but that we have plenty of solutions. Solutions that make sense, that are affordable, and that can really change the Europe. Also, when it comes to economic issues, labor issues, the budgetary difficulties of the European Union and the member countries. So that isn't even the case. So I have to conclude to go back that once we combine our forces, I think we have to cooperate better also with communication experts to make our voice heard so that it raises emotions that the politicians feel that they gain support from the voter side once listening and working together with us. That's where the short coming is the biggest, I think, at the moment. And we really have to be better because we are already better at all the other levels. What I just mentioned that needs to be there in order to gain a big victory on a political level. Thank you very much, Duya. You, you've given us uh, some really good advice that, you know, why are we not getting through? We have clearly not hit the right emotional buttons of compassion and fear. We haven't got the message through that there are solutions that are both affordable and they make sense and can be delivered. So that's uh, what we're focusing on a little bit. How do we generate the political tension to make this happen? I'm going to open the floor for a, a short exchange at this point. And I noted that Dr. Ivana Halaskova, you had raised your virtual hand. You've already been very active in the chat. Thank you. If you'd like to say something uh, to members of the audience, please raise your virtual hand or signal in the chat. And when I call on you, please put your camera on um, and unmute yourself. So, Dr. Ivana, would you like to unmute yourself and share what you'd like to say? If not, I'll take the next person, which is Zhao Morais. Zhao, I see you there already. Please unmute yourself. Hello, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, the honor for me to be here. I'm clinical cardiologist in Portugal, and I'm here because I'm currently a member of the Advocacy Committee, European Society of Cardiology. It's a great opportunity to, to discuss. I only want to have a, a brief comment on our task for today. We are discussing cardiovascular disease in Europe, and we are usually concentrated in the primary prevention, in the, the prevention in terms of lifestyle, uh, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and so on. This is this is our job. This is what we're doing within the last years. But it is important to claim your attention that there are a lot of cardiovascular conditions um, behind uh, the primary prevention setting. Young people are dying by sudden death. Genetic disorders are particularly particularly important uh, among us. Um, the young people is dying. It's not only the elderly people dying by myocardial infarction or stroke. Young people are dying to cardiovascular diseases, particularly genetic disorders and particularly arrhythmias. Sudden death is a real important problem in Europe. It's a real important problem in well-developed countries and in not so well-developed countries. So this is only a brief, a brief comment about our task. You are focusing on cardiovascular disease in general terms, but we need to do something regarding this particular part of our population, this young generation. And we need a lot of research in this field because it is a, a clear lack of research in this field. We need to do more. It's possible to do more. We are able to do more, but we need to join efforts of everybody. We need to put a lot of money on research in this field because this field is also particularly important behind the elderly people. Thank you so much for your, you. your, your attention. And it's only a brief comment to have for our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jao. Please, before you go, you mentioned, you know, young people and the sudden death with congenital issues. Would newborn screening address this? Because you talked about, you know, young people, and I, we all, I'm sure we've all read the newspaper stories of a young football star who just drops dead in the middle of somebody who's young and healthy and active and sportive, and suddenly it, it's linked to a genetic. Do, would newborn screening do this? How would we, yes. you know... Yes, it's possible to screen because most of these people dying suddenly, they have a family history uh, suggesting the possibility to die suddenly. So it's possible to, to do something in the schools, it's possible to do something in the high schools, not only in sports, not only in, 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 uh, in uh, sports activity, but also in the schools, 
those in the high school is possible to screen. It's possible to screen um, briefly with a single survey, with a single questionnaire, with a, with a single questions, uh, because most of these people die suddenly have a family history of sudden death. And very briefly, simple, an SEG, a simple SEG costs uh, one pence or so. Um, it's so easy to identify a lot of people dying suddenly or candidates to, to die suddenly. This is possible to, to do. It's possible to be done uh, without um, too much money. Uh, so this is easy. It's not difficult. OK, thank you. So there it's like largely a question of awareness because they could be built into the kinds of school prevention programs. I'd like to bring in Arlene Wilkie now to, from the audience to share something. And obviously, you, Arlene, I know that you work very strongly in the area of stroke, and I think you wanted to make the link between cardiovascular disease and stroke. Arlene, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi, good morning. Hi, go ahead. Hi. Hi. My, just my question to, 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 to the speakers and, and the panel this morning was, was just about the, um, the, is this conversation including stroke? Um, we, we, we've talked a lot already about heart. We've talked about the, the 210 billion cost. Our recent research shows that uh, the cost of stroke in Europe is around 60 billion. So that's quite a substantial um, chunk of your 210 billion. So I just wanted just to check with the, with the guests today. Are we talking about uh, heart or are we talking about heart and stroke? Lovely. Thanks very much, uh, Arlene. And maybe I'll, I'll invite Stefan Ackenbach to come in and pick up on those points. Um, I know also in the chat, uh, Birgit Beger from the European Heart Network has added the links for those who are interested to follow up on newborn screening to see how that could be used. Um, so, Stefan, would you like just to pick up on a couple of the elements that we've made before we move on? Go ahead, Stefan. Aspects. Number one, yes, usually when we talk about cardiovascular disease, it includes stroke. But stroke and heart disease is immediately related. A large proportion of stroke is due to hypertension. A large proportion of stroke is due to atrial fibrillation. So stroke due to heart disease. Stroke and heart disease belong together. And the numbers that we typically discuss include the numbers for stroke. But I would like to take just 30 seconds to make another point. I'm sensing something in the discussion that there is, you know, it's, can we do this by primary prevention? Can we do this by screening? Can we do this by education? Can we do this by better treatment? It's not, you know, fighting one against the other. It's all of these. Because cardiovascular disease is so large, 36% of the deaths are caused by cardiovascular disease. It's not all one disease. We cannot tackle the entire problem by primary prevention because sudden death you will not find by primary prevention. It strikes people, you know, in the middle of the day and um, without any risk factors, a tremendous large amount of patients with heart attacks have no risk factors. So it's not one or the other or the other. We should not fight one aspect against the other aspects. We need all of these approaches to make a leeway to fight cardiovascular disease. Uh, thank you very much, um, Stefan. I think you, you've made a very elegant point there about exactly why we need to have a European approach that covers this, because it isn't as simple as saying prevention or um, you know, primary scheming. It needs to be much broader. I'm going to go back to some of our speakers now, and then there'll be another opportunity to bring in the audience. Let me bring in uh, Jean-Luc Lemercier, the Corporate Vice President for Europe and the Middle East, Africa, Canada and Latin America at Edwards Life Sciences. And we've just heard about just how complex this issue is. It starts from newborns and screening, education and awareness. We're looking at, you know, support for stroke, for cardiovascular disease, monitoring. There's a huge amount of work here to be dealt with. What, in your view, needs to be done to prepare for an EU action plan on cardiovascular diseases? What should be the priority areas that we should focus on? Jean-Luc. Thank you, Tamsin, for the opportunity <clears throat> to share uh, the medtech industry point of view uh, today in this meeting. So we, we have just heard from the previous speaker uh, how important the burden of cardiovascular disease uh, is in our region. We heard number one killer uh, in Europe, a huge uh, amount, huge cost for our society. So it looks like everybody agrees on those elements, uh, fundamental elements. Our industry 
the MedTech Industry Cardiovascular Group that I have the honor to lead and represent today provides concrete solutions to the burden of the disease on individuals, family, and the wider economy. Our medical innovation spans the full spectrum of patient care, from diagnostic to cure, save life, and add tremendous value to European society. Those days, as we know, we are slowly exiting the COVID-19 crisis, and it is crucial to address the severe disruptions that affected cardiovascular patient care, as mentioned previously by the different speakers, and in addition to reinforce our healthcare system. Addressing the cardiovascular disease with an overarching European plan and full set of policies has become an imminent priority to improve resilience and health of citizens. Such a plan would represent the concerted integration of the solution and innovations that truly make the difference in the life of patients. This is why, as MedTech industry, we launched today a dedicated roadmap calling for the setup of such a European plan for cardiovascular health. In this roadmap, we provide ideas and suggestions considering the complete patient pathway from prevention and early detection to access to care and treatment and improving, of course, quality of life, while keeping in mind two important elements, the role of digital and innovation at all the stages. This roadmap developed in collaboration with experts in the field will provide several thematic policy recommendations to place the health of citizens at the heart of action through EU for Health, Horizon Europe, and the Next Generation Recovery Funds. Those Recommendations are incorporating elements such as facilitating best practice through the setup of a joint action to prevention, early detection, and rehabilitation. Create a common European cardiovascular disease information system to improve registries and monitor patient access to care. Improve access and innovation by bringing processes that enable the execution of early feasibility studies in Europe. Invest smartly to improve access to detection, treatment, and reward innovations that improve patient outcomes. And capitalize and accelerate digitalization. As you see, the idea is there. The solutions and technology exist. The stakeholders are invested and ready to collaborate. What we need now is a political commitment to act for heart and beat cardiovascular disease. Our industry stands ready to deliver and collaborate to make a European action a plan a reality. Thank you, uh, Tamsin. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Luc. And we'll make sure that in the chats we have the link to the uh, action plan that you're just launching. And, and this is a combined work but by the industry, the European Society of Cardiologists, the European Heart Network, the stakeholders come together to say how can we get the political traction to have some action on cardiovascular disease at European level? Um, I'd now like to share with you a video from another member of the European Parliament, from Brando Benefe, because we asked him what should be in an EU roadmap. Let's hear what he has to say. Dear participants, dear colleagues, I'm delighted that you all met today to discuss an EU plan for heart health to tackle the number one killer uh, in Europe, uh, heart diseases. Unfortunately, I was unable to participate uh, uh, in person today, to today's discussions, but I wanted to express my strong support for action to tackle the burden of cardiovascular diseases. Despite the fact that cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death in the EU, EU actions on this topic are bundled together with all other non-communicable diseases. Uh, a standalone action on this front is needed. As co-chair of the MEP Heart Group, I'm already convinced of the need for this standalone action plan on CVDs. It is up to us to ensure that my colleagues in the Parliament, Commission and Member States also recognize this need and join us in taking action. If we convince them, we can offer clear ideas for an EU action plan 
um, for uh, CVDs could look like. In 2018, I launched a manifesto for a healthier Europe in which I called with other colleagues for establishing a joint action on structural heart diseases, ensuring that screening for heart diseases is included in all health checks over the age of 65, and obviously any action plan must involve an exchange of best practices, sharing of data among member states, and the creation of proper registries for age-related heart conditions. On screening, it should put, put us into a shame that any EU citizens can die from a lack of a heart health check, young people and older people. So detection, detection must become the mantra of a CVD plan for an aging society. These are just a few of the challenges that we face. We could also mention the specifics of diagnosing cardiovascular diseases in women, ensuring access for citizens in more rural areas, and closer monitoring of cardiac conditions detected at birth. The scale of the challenge is great, and we need policy solutions that respond proportionally to this scale. I'm looking forward to hearing feedback on the ideas put forward today. This need for an action plan is uh, more and more urgent. Thank you for participating today, and let's take a step closer to make this a reality for Europe. Thank you, Mr. Benefe, and I, I like very much the, this mantra you gave us of detection, detection, detection. At whatever age there's a risk, at whatever age cardiovascular issues could arise, if we detect it and we address the diagnostic inequalities, we're much further along the line at treating more effectively because we've had some comments on the chat to say the faster we diagnose, the earlier stage we find the cardiovascular disease, the better the health outcome and therefore the more effective and more cost efficient the intervention. I'd now like to introduce another member of the European Parliament, Mr. Joazas Olikas, who was also a former health minister from Lithuania. What would you like to share with us about where you see the priorities for Europe making an um, access? And particularly, you might pick up on the issue of inequalities. We heard that a woman in Lithuania has got 13 times more risk of dying than a woman in France. So clearly, inequalities is a big challenge. Mr. Olikas. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for organizing this our uh, meeting. And uh, after the, the detection, I think we should find a reason. We must uh, be sought everywhere, both by asking questions about the uh, policies we implement that contribute to health, stress-reducing life for people, and identifying the aspects of daily uh, life that influence the development of this disease. I must emphasize that uh, heart disease follows a social uh, gradient. Uh, those who find themselves in uh, lower the uh, social position in society are at the higher uh, risk. We must uh, tackle this inequality also. Everything was said before, it, that's true. Uh, but also we should think about the role of COVID in identification and treatment of uh, cardiovascular diseases uh, must be also considered. The COVID-19 pandemic caused significant problems uh, when the people in need uh, across uh, Europe found it challenging to meet the professionals or get uh, emergency help. We cannot uh, allow this uh, trade-off to occur where global health trends and the fight against them are replacing the fight against essential disease such as uh, cardiovascular disease. I am uh, therefore convinced uh, that we must strengthen the EU capacity to shape the health policy across the EU to eliminate the disparities between the member states and eliminate the equalities between the different social uh, groups of society. We should uh, arrange the minimum standards for prevention, detection, treatment, and daily life uh, in the European uh, level. For that, we created an interparliamentary group uh, for stronger uh, European health. And uh, I think we need to strengthen the European competence in the, in the field of uh, health. Uh, we will have the opportunities to invest in this area and pay the quality and serious European attention and eliminate all the inequalities that are currently costing uh, our citizens uh, their lives. And uh, Stefan said, 
I think we indeed need a holistic approach, but holistic not only in one and other countries, but holistic across uh, the European Union. And allocate some uh, uh, resources for that, to strengthening to more inform our citizens and to help the professional for more education, more common programs, more common uh, trainings, uh, exchange of best practice, and also uh, strengthening the attention, not only on primary and secondary prevention, but on the treatment after, after detection and uh, the life after, uh, after the uh, cardiac diseases uh, happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Olekes. Uh, another view from the European Parliament calling very strongly for a greater role for health and using the European capacity to coordinate action across different countries so that we can address the social gradient of health. And I think that's also one of the clear messages that came through as a result of the COVID pandemic. Where there were inequalities as a society, you had the heaviest impact of the pandemic and we will only get a healthier population in Europe when we tackle some of these levels of social exclusion. I'm going to bring in the last uh, speaker before I open the floor to the audience. So please raise your virtual hand and our chat is very active. We've got some really good comments coming in there. But now let me bring in uh, Pierre Delso who's the Deputy Director General for the European Commission inside the DG Sante, which deals with health. Um, we, we've heard that you know, there is an enormous burden from cardiovascular disease. And although it benefits from the broader efforts that Europe is doing on prevention and promotion, some of the energy generated by the cancer plan, which is looking at those big issues, and people have mentioned things like, you know, physical activity and tobacco in this uh, conversation, but we've also heard that cardiovascular disease is different. It's unique. It can strike at any age. It can be at congenital level, so children can be born with it. It can strike suddenly, young, healthy people in their 20s, as well as the more traditional understanding of a chronic condition that comes later in life linked to lifestyle issues. So despite it being the main cause of mortality, we still don't have a standalone plan for cardiovascular disease uh, at European level. So ha what's your view in the European Commission? You know, could or would cardiovascular diseases be able to benefit from such a standalone program? And how would you bring those different elements from research, diagnosis, telemedicine, bring it all together if you don't have a program to do that? Pierre. Thank you very much, Tamzin, and thank you very much for this is very interesting discussion on a very important topic. So let me be basically focusing on some number, certain number of key messages. First of all, we all agree that heart disease is a real problem and we need to do better in Europe like in the rest of the world. So the number of people dying from heart disease is still too big. And as you say, too much inequality is also in Europe. So we really need to do better on that front. I believe there is a consensus around this, you know, this idea. Second message coming from the COVID crisis, of course, uh, health remains a competence at national level, but it's clear that one of the lessons of the COVID crisis is we need more coordination at EU level. We need to make sure that more things are being developed at EU level. And from that point of view, one message also on which we really believe as the Europe, European Commission is the fact that we need to build a strong European health union. That's something which is very fundamental if we really want to achieve, you know, more equality also between the different member states, between the different places in Europe. And that's something which is important. Again, not changing the competence of the member states, but making sure that we have more coordination at EU level and more work being done at EU level. Third message, I've heard all the plea for, uh, for an action plan and for having something equivalent to what we have for the beating cancer action plan, but for heart diseases. I've taken note of this. But we have also to be realistic where we are where we are. And at the moment, we don't have such a plan. And so the question for us is, are we only focusing on the plan or are we making sure that we deliver on actions which will have the same effect? And that was the message I would like to convey at this stage, that at this stage, we are focusing on a certain number of very important actions which can make a difference also for heart diseases. First of all, you already mentioned the European Beating Cancer Plan. If you look, look at some of the actions which are forcing there, 
they will have also an effect on heart diseases. You know, the question of obesity, you know, uh, the question of alcohol, tobacco, this kind of, I don't need to list everything, but clearly it will have an effect on heart diseases. So if we implement the European beating cancer plan, it will have positive consequences also for heart disease. Second element also, which I would like to mention for you, which is important, the revision of the pharmaceutical legislation. Nobody has mentioned it. But we are in the process of revising this uh, uh, legislation. It's an important piece of information. And again, we can use this maybe to build, you know, to create some possibilities also to fight heart diseases in Europe. Third element, and it was mentioned also uh, from some, uh, some of the speakers, EU for Health. As you know, this is a big program with a lot of money, maybe not so much this year, but in the future. And one aspect of EU for Health is non-communicable diseases, so including, of course, heart diseases. It's a huge leverage, a huge possibility to finance actions which can make a difference. So that's a possibility which is up there. We are discussing now the work program for this year with the member state, but of course, we will have to prepare a new work program for the future with also with the member state and the European Parliament, of course, clearly. They need to be involved, both of them, both institutions. But it's important that you make known your contribution and we use the resources of the EU for health just to try to fight our diseases. Another important element also, which is, you know, which is very important, is research and innovation. Because if you want also to fight for the future, we need to develop research and innovation. And Horizon Europe is a very powerful tool in this context. And again, we want to focus, and we certainly have in our mind, the idea that RDC is an important element on which we need to invest more with respect to research and innovation. And finally, last but not least, you know, the recovery fund, and I know Mr. Le Mercier has mentioned it, but, the, you know, the resilience recovery fund, which is a huge amount of money, and from the Commission point of view, health it should be one of the priority for the member states to invest in. So we really count on the member states, and we certainly will help the member states to come up with ambitious plans in the field of health, because that's also one of the of the crisis. So to come back to your question and to conclude, because I've been asked to be short, I don't have a plan for the moment to offer to you. But the message I want to convey to you is that even if we don't have a, a plan for the moment, we have a lot of actions which could have a very positive effect to fight you know, heart diseases in Europe. And we are fully aware of this, and we are making internally within the Commission, we are making the link between all those actions to make sure that we are efficient. Because again, as a conclusion, what I would say, after the COVID crisis, and we are still in the COVID crisis, but after the COVID crisis, one lesson which should be clear for everybody in Europe that health is fundamental and we need to continue to invest deeply in health if we want to protect our society, our citizens, and if we want to continue to develop in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pierre, um, for, for giving us this, an overview of the potential levers and mechanisms and reminding us that uh, unlike previous mandates, there is both serious political commitment and a much larger financial capacity. And we're only just starting to think about how we could make a difference on this. And um, before I op open the floor, Pierre, let me uh, come back on a point, which is we we've got the stakeholders who come together and are putting forward a sort of heart plan for Europe. And while I appreciate that you don't have one internally in the European Commission, you've committed there to being able to link together all of these different elements to achieve change. To what extent can you and the Commission work with these external stakeholders that bring together the, the cardiovascular community and you've got political support from the Parliament? They, they're presenting to you, here is a potential action plan for heart health. How closely can they liaise with your team to be able to identify that part could be delivered through Horizon Europe. This part could be done through the Resilience Fund. So I think it, we're looking to see what kind of partnership we could develop with you. Thank you very much for your question. You know, I don't believe as European Commission we can develop such a thing in isolation. We need to be in close contact with the stakeholders. We need to be in close contact, you know, with people who are really, you know, fighting these diseases on a daily basis, but also we, we have ideas. So the message I could give to you, all of you, but not only those listening to this, but also outside of this call, is basically our door is open. Because clearly we need your input and we want to continue to have your input just to make sure that we find ideas. And you mentioned, for instance, the financial capacities which exist now. It would be interesting also to give, receive ideas and to say maybe, you know, this is the type of action you could finance with au 4 s money, you know, in the future or Horizon Europe. So message is clear also my door and the door of my colleagues is open because we cannot, you know, develop and find such a disease without your input. We need you and we will listen to you.
Thank you very much, Pierre. I think that's a very welcome message to our audience and a, and a call for action, a call to coordinate, to uh, motivate the member states to use their capacity um, through the EU for Health programme and Horizon Europe to put this issue on the agenda and to coordinate. We've had some messages in the chat about potential joint actions that could be done, and that was mentioned by some of the MEPs. In our, our last 10 minutes, let me open the floor to people who might like to share something. Uh, Panos Vardas, you'd, uh, at an earlier point, you said you wanted to come in. Josette Maria Gascon, you put some interesting points in the chat about Yes, ECGs, they're relatively cheap, but they're not very accessible. They're not very comfortable. We could use digital tools. I welcome you to come in. Uh, Benoit Morez, you've also put some good points in here to say where can we move forward. Ricardo Astegias, you've put your, Astegiano, you've put your hand up. So let's, let's go through that. Uh, Panos, go ahead and we'll, I'll bring in the others. Good morning and congratulations for this initiative. It is really pivotal and of paramount importance. On top of what uh, very well said by uh, our president, Professor Eichebach, I would like to comment in brief. One, the economic burden of cardiovascular disease is still unknown, as this number, 210 billion, is obsolete, literally obsolete, at least 20, 25 years old. European Society of Cardiology, in collaboration with the University of Oxford, is working actively now to recalculate the real cost and the burden in general. Second, please remember that as the population is aging, we could, to some degree, separate the cardiac diseases in two categories, the classical, the traditional, and the de degenerative uh, cardiovas cardiovascular diseases, like um, atrial fibrillation, like uh, valve, cardiac valve uh, problems, and we have to look ahead how it's going to be the cost and the needs around this new reality. And third, please remember, thanks to the investments, thanks to the devotion of the healthcare professionals, cardiovascular medicine during the last 50 years has made huge, again, huge progress. Please, there is a risk. Cardiovascular community and healthcare professionals and the industry related to cardiovascular medicine to become a victim of its success. Everybody to come and say, oh, come on, there is a stenosis of LAD, we have to make an angioplasty in the morning and the, the evening, she or he will be again back to the European Parliament. Come on, the cardiologists have solved everything. So please remember that we need more money, more invest investments, to fight the number one killer, sudden cardiac death, for example. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you for that, Panos. And again, reminding us that even though we've made huge progress in how we treat, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't make efforts to prevent, to promote and reduce the burden of, of suffering. Let me bring Josep Maria Gascon, uh, Gascon in. You're a European young leader working with us here at uh, Friends of Europe. And you've made a couple of points, I think, looking at technology and telemedicine that might be useful to hear from. Yeah, hello. Thanks for, for letting me in. Uh, I first, thank you very much for putting this uh, super lineup speaking to to about uh, about the, this key 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 issue that we we face in the world and and you and in europe and as uh, panos was was indicating there is a, a need for investing it's made a, a lot it's been huge progress uh, on the last 50 years but now we are we are on a on a bench of 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 uh on the verge of 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 a change a change which is uh, why not to use Technology. So uh, why not to to think that telemedicine that has proved as a key on maintaining public health uh, uh, in a balance? Uh, we need to apply to the general population, children, etc. We need to to screen. We need to rule out uh, in in early stages the the cardiovascular disease, which means, as Joao was saying uh, earlier. Um, it's not only it's not only the, the the clinical history of of the parents. It's also that perhaps we don't need 
to go to uh, uh, electrocardiograms uh, of 12 uh, LEDs, which is over here. There is already many, many devices around that puts doctors and individuals in contact with four LEDs, six LEDs, less than 12, but at least to, to rule out these cardiovascular uh, diseases and universalize, to, to democratize this access to prevention. We said before, I think there is a consensus that uh, early prevention is, is uh, saves uh, lives, saves uh, money for the health system. And well, I think that politically, there should be first an initiative to, to invest more and at the same time to encourage um, private and public uh, consortiums or associations in order to, to bring uh, more, more, more uh, health, uh, healthy access. To, to the individuals. Thanks, thanks, Josep. Um, you're giving us again some insight as to not the progress isn't just in pharmaceuticals and surgery and treatment, it's also in technology that we can use. I'm going to take two more interventions from the floor before I, I go back to our speakers and ask them for one big idea to move Europe forward. If I could ask uh, Benoit and Ricardo to make very short interventions, just uh, 30 seconds, what would you like to say? Benoit, you, you're an advisor to Maggie Block, who was a long-time health minister here in Belgium, so I'm sure this is an issue you've tackled. What would you suggest? What's your prescription for what Europe could do? Yes, uh, <laughs> what I could do, uh, I'm not sure, but I think uh, we need to put uh, this issue in a highlight with as much as possible stakeholders to put the importance of uh, uh, on um, why we really need uh, cardiac um, or a cardiovascular uh, or heart action plan in the European Union. It's the major killer. It's often unknown with the general public. And I think uh, this really is a, a need for a change. And um, I think uh, from my point, uh, position, uh, we can uh, as much as uh, possible within the public uh, trying to emphasize uh, the importance of this plan. And I also believe it would bring up to the inequity that uh, exists today that a lot of, uh, uh, in my experience, a lot of other non-communicable chronic disease get a lot of attention, but unfortunately not uh, uh, cardiac disease. So that's um, what I really wanted to say. And I really can hope that the European Commission can do whatever effort is within her uh, uh, possibility to help the European Society of Cardiology and other European uh, stakeholders to put this highly on the agenda, like uh, she did for some other diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benoit. Ricardo, a brief comment. Yes, it is connected with what uh, said the panels before. Uh, I think that the community, the society, the people have not the right uh, perception of what are the cardiovascular diseases. If you ask uh, to someone, would you like to die of cancer or of, of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease? For sure, he has much more fear of cancer and not of cardiovascular disease. We have to modify the perception of the community about cardiovascular disease. And this, I think, is a key um, uh, for, for, for success. Uh, in the, in the, for example, inside the cancer beating plan, uh, the cancer uh, patients' uh, societies have been involved strongly. And we need to do also the same for uh, modify the perception of the public uh, against the cardiovascular diseases, I think. And uh, patients should be one of the uh, stakeholders in this process. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, and I'm now going to invite our speakers uh, to come back in the same order they spoke to give the one big idea. We've, we've heard there at the end a couple of points to say people aren't frightened enough 
of cardiovascular disease. You know, if they're given a choice about what they die of, they take heart disease because they think it's not so, such a big deal. So clearly some work to go. Let me come back to you, Stefan. You started our conversation by telling us about your, your night on call last night and being called to the hospital, a woman in, after a serious heart attack with blocked valves, major operation, you know, and she's in her 40s. We clearly need to do better on this. What's the one big idea you think Europe should be able to do? Well, I think at the end of such a wonderful um, event, it is important to remain optimistic. We hear, for example, from Pierre Delzot that a lot of things are already being done. We are facing a tremendously large problem and a multifaceted problem from pollution and nutrition to prevention to treatment and rehabilitation, a massive problem. But where there is a multifaceted problem, there are also lots of opportunities. So let's be optimistic, join forces, provide the research funding from the EEC position. That's the most important point, the research funding to develop new methods for fighting cardiovascular disease and to collect data. And there's absolutely no reason why Europe should not be the global champion in fighting cardiovascular disease. And this is what we have to aim for. Thank you, Stefan. Very positive note there. Manuel, let me bring you back in. You know, Stefan said there's no reason why we shouldn't be the global champion in tackling cardiovascular disease. What's your big idea that we should take forward? Yes, I fully agree, of course, with Professor Achenbach. But uh, I, will, I can say that, we're, of course, we cannot live uh, without a beating heart. Show it's our obligation to promote the health of our heart. And I think that... We should uh, uh, fight for a European health union that help everybody to take care of their heart. This is my message. Thank you. Thuya, let me bring you back in because uh, you mentioned that we need, as a former politician, we need sort of fear and emotion and compassion to get things moving. And at the end, just there, we heard that people don't fear heart disease enough, and that's why we don't get the action. What's your big idea? Should we scare Europeans into action? Um, not only scare, but if we go back to the, what we just heard, everybody accepts that it's a killer number one. And it's also a kill number one reason for suffering, terrible suffering, bigger than even in cancer or in mental, air, uh, mental health issues. And what is the feedback we get? Things are as they are, that we know you're right, but we are not really going to do as much as we are supposed to do. I'm very thankful that there are possibilities to cooperate. There are op options. I, I, I stay optimistic, as, as, the, as told today, but we have to just remember the reaction we just caused. Number one reason, but nevertheless, you can say aloud that things are as they are. And we have to change that. And so my last words are that this is not going to be okay unless we join our forces to make a better common message true. Not only patients and activist organizations and NGOs as us and you and medical professionals, but that we are not, there is this danger that we are a little bit too satisfied with ourselves and we don't understand that this is not right, this is not fair and that we need to really raise our voice. We need to be a little bit uh, maybe aggressive, not to be satisfied until somebody answers us otherwise than saying things are as they are. Okay, Th thank you, Tuya. Let me turn to Jean-Luc, because we heard very clearly the status quo is not acceptable. And because the status quo is not acceptable, business as usual is not acceptable. Uh, Jean-Luc, we, we heard from Pierre, he said his door is open. Come in and work with us, talk to us. If you've got a plan, we're interested in seeing how it can be developed, but we're not going to create the plan ourselves. Jean-Luc, what's your big idea? My big idea first, which is confirmed following the conversation we had all together this morning, it looks definitively, we have a knowledge, we have an understanding, we have some action which are already there uh, going after cardiovascular disease. We have different vehicles for funding, which are already there as well, which can mobilize some projects. So, so you have a lot of action, you have a lot of knowledge, but again, to have all that very efficient, we need a plan. 
And we need to create this action plan for cardiovascular disease at the European level, because initiatives are all there. The ideas are there, but we definitely have a plan which are going to, to provide the necessary support on the mid and long term to tackle this disease. And all the different elements have been discussed this morning. Invest and strengthen research on cardiovascular. Uh, facilitate all the best practice we all know on prevention, early detection, rehabilitation. So all that needs to be there. Uh, strengthen the access to treatment. Uptake of the innovation is something which is critical. Digital, digital has been mentioned several times, and this is a, a, an area we need to pursue. And we need to have a plan to gather all those efforts and to be able to execute. That's what I would, my big idea is, uh, Tasmin. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Uh, let me now turn to Joses from the European Parliament. How can you use, you know, the, the political will and the engagement and momentum you've got in the Parliament to try and create this momentum for a European heart plan? I think this is not only for the European Parliament. This is for all uh, European society. Now we are in the moment of uh, conference of future of European Union. And after one year discussion, my proposal is uh, to have a new treaty of European Union, then more uh, responsibility for European Union would be on the European level. We need more coordination, we need more common action, we need more holistic approach, we need more education on the higher level research, and this should be on also on the European level, not uh, leave the, uh, every member state alone. I think only united, uh, with united efforts, we can achieve the, the results. And this is the main proposal to kill the, the first the killer of European Union citizens. <laughs> Thank you for that. Kill the killer. That's, I think, a, a good uh, message or slogan for us to have in mind. Pierre, let me invite you to have the very last word, you know, a big idea. We've got a reminder in the chat from Neil Johnson about the demographics of Europe, that we're getting older, and this is a good thing, but we're not always uh, ageing in good health. So cardiovascular disease, you know, the, the heaviest burden of it falls on an ageing population. But we had the message right at the beginning that it, unlike many other chronic conditions, cardiovascular disease can strike at any age and is right the way through the life course. So looking at this, you know, age continuity perspective, what's your big idea about how Europe could move forward? Thank you very much. First of all, I'm not sure I would be asked a question whether I would prefer to die from heart disease or, you know, cancer. It's a, like Sophie's choice, you know. <laughs> Actually, I would prefer not to die if I had the choice, but that's not realistic also. Now, uh, I didn't say that we, we will never have a plan. I say we don't have a plan now, which is a slightly different issue. But my message to you is simply, we have a lot of instruments which are there where decisions are being taken now at EU level. If we wait too long, those opportunities will be missed. You know, we talk about the RRF. RRF decisions are being taken now. You know, eu 4 s we are now working on the work program. Horizon Europe, we are now working on the investment research, you know. So my point is, it's very good to, and I say my door is open, but we need to move and to focus on concrete actions now. And because if we want to fight this, and as you say, because of, you know, aging population, we need to move fast on this to make sure that Europe, you know, is a safer place. And I like the slogan from Mr. Olekas, you know, killing the killer is a very nice slogan. Maybe that's, I hope one day we will be there. Thank you for that, Pierre, and I'm going to bring our fantastic conversation to a conclusion. Thank you all for participating. It's been a very active inputs from the chat, very useful. And thank you all to our speakers for being short, concise, but very powerful. We, we left it there that there is an invitation for action, that there are multiple instruments across Europe that could have an impact, but the planning for how they will be used is happening now. So this now lies on the, sh the shoulders of the stakeholders to come together. There's a, there's a common vision that's been developed for, a, for an EU action plan, but it's now up to us to talk with the different parts of the commission. And I, I, I take it that we've got a, a fantastic uh, offer from Pierre Dessau. His door is open to help listen and coordinate the input to those different elements. But the time is now. 
There may not be a plan yet. That doesn't mean there won't be one in the future. And we should be working towards making sure that Europe has a plan to kill Europe's biggest killers. And who doesn't want to catch a killer? Thank you very much from Brussels. It's been a real pleasure being with you. I look forward to seeing you at another event, either at the Friends of Europe or for the Africa Europe Foundation. And you can find out more information there on the website. There's the links to our events. Thank you all for being here and goodbye from Brussels. Great.